Drew. Um, so welcome everybody back. Uh, this is the dreaded after lunch event when you're all in a carbohydrate coma. So hopefully you'll all wake up with the, uh, the fierce debate that is about to be ignited here. Um, uh, the inventor of the on-slide system, Wesley, assures me it's going to be working. Uh, so, um, uh, so please put your hand up and uh, give an opinion. You don't have to just be putting, standing up to ask a question. Stand up, let's ask an opinion. We want to hear what you think as well. Quickly introduce you to the panel. Uh, I shall start from this side. Pat Meenan from Google, the inventor of web page test, the, basically the best page load performance testing tool out there. Um, Wesley Hales from Shape Security, um, front-end developer, inventor of, uh, of OnSlide and uh, loadreport.js. We have Luke Blaney from the FT, um, very much did a lot of work on speeding up the FT web app and is a big fan of Varnish, apparently. Um, we have uh, Peter Hedinskog. Okay, from Cybercom Group, uh, creator of SiteSpeed IO and Browser Time. And last but not least, we have Andy Davies uh, from NCC Group, web performance velocity speaker, um, and the person who is going to kick off with the introduction. Cool. Andy. Right. So, yes. Cool. Okay, so. Steve's already introduced me, but I'm Andy, and I'm frustrated. <laughs> and the reason I'm frustrated is the web is too slow. Or rather, too many sites are too slow. Because, you know, we've been talking about why we need to make web pages faster for a long time. Steve Souders first invented the concept back in 2006, 2007, he wrote his book. And we understand how to make sites faster. And this is one of the reasons why I really get frustrated. We know that to make sites faster, we need to minimize latency. Whether that's using a CDN to move um, our content closer to our users, whether it's speeding up our backends so the time to first byte is quicker. You know, we know latency doesn't change. You know, it's governed by the speed of light, so we have to move to reduce it. The other thing we need to do is, you know, cut down the number of round trips we make, because every round trip is bounded by how quickly we can make it, or the latency involved. You know, and we do this via turning on gzip to compress stuff. We use minification. We merge resources together in a build system. And one of the reasons we do all this is there's a tension between how we build sites, so how we break it down into modular components, and the best for way to get them to the browser for the browser to be able to load the page quickly and render it quickly. We, um, you know, so, you know, we can minimize latency, we can reduce the number of round trips, and we can minimize blocking because some of our resources block. If we've got CSS, we have to wait for the CSS before we can render the page. If we've got JavaScript, we have to wait for the JavaScript to execute. And before we can move on. We have web fonts. And now, depending on how we load web fonts, sometimes we have to wait for them, sometimes we don't. The other way of making sites load fast is to maximize the value we get out of the first round trip. So when you hear Paul Irish on stage at Fluent Conference talking about put it in the first 15K, this is effective what he's talking about. He's talking about turn the initial con TCP initial congestion window up to 10, make so you get a roughly about 14.8k depending on how big your tcp segments are in it and push that out to the browser everything you need to render the page on that first hit so that's what the guardian do on the mobile site you know they have the content the idea that they serve out the content which is the html and css to render the page they have the enhancements so where they insert javascript for um, swiping and then they have the idea of leftovers so advertising analytics so, you know, we can make our pages faster, you know, but we seem to want to leave it to the browsers to do it. And browsers are doing a great job and have done a great job over the years of helping us make our pages faster. You know, the HTTP standard recommends we only have two connections, two TCP connections to our server. But we've moved on from that. You know, typically browsers have four or six or sometimes even eight. They open TCP connections in advance. They 
speculate that we're going to request something from the same server. So we open the connection, it's there ready for us to use. We have the preloader, which while we're busy waiting for CSS or blocked on JavaScript to execute, the preloader will go looking through the rest of the page, picking up um, the resources the page will need to complete, prioritizing them, and downloading them in the most optimal <coughs> order. We've got faster JS engines, we've got new image formats, faster layout engines. So, you know, browsers are doing a great job. We also have new protocols. Um, HTTP doesn't fit very well on top of TCP. So we have Speedy now, we have HTTP2 coming. And they will help improve the performance of our sites. On some tests I did, I got a 30% uplift in performance just by switching to Speedy. And that includes the um, TLS negotiation overhead. Um, HTTP2 may get rid of some of our build steps. It may reduce the need to merge stuff. Um, we're still going to have the challenge, though, that we have people on HTTP 1 as well as HTTP on or people on HTTP 2. We're going to have to work out how to optimize for both. But despite all these improvements that keep coming across, we keep adding more and more stuff to our pages. Our pages are getting fatter. We're relying on browsers and networks to overcome the performance hurdle. And perhaps more worrying is we're including more blocking resources. Now, the number of times I see a tweet going, somebody going, I hate web fonts because this is the experience I get and a page with no text on it, but yet they put web fonts on their own site. So, you know, we're making our pages more and more complex and delivering more and more of a challenge. We can automate some of this optimization. So we talk about merging stuff and image optimization. We can use things like Mod Page Speed or Akamai's FEO service to take some of these optimizations away to simplify our build services. But, okay, so why aren't we getting faster? And my view is we don't measure enough. You know, we've got great tools. This is SiteSpeed.io that Peter wrote. We've got things like web page test. We can measure in the visitor's browser. So we can measure at a page level. We can measure individual resources. We can tag the page so we can measure when something we're interesting appears. But, you know, there's a lot of data. And we need to move beyond why which pages are slow to why are they slow. You know, this is a waterfall in web page test. There's actually some interesting things in this waterfall in that the time to first bytes are always about 200 milliseconds. And this is because I did the test from Dulles in Virginia instead of the UK by mistake. You know, but I ended up looking at this for a while, working out what was wrong with it. And it took me a while. And am I destined to be a human pattern matcher? for network waterfalls for the rest of my life to help make the web faster. You know, we need to move on to how do we fix it. You know, and we know the order browsers need resources to be able to render a page and get a page to a user, but, you know, we don't really have the tools to help us get there. And finally, you know, we think of performance as a technical issue, and it's not, or I would argue there are technical aspects to it. But we need to go back and think about performance as an aspect of user experience. You know, we go to Fluent or Velocity or Edge Conference and talk about page load performance. But we need to fit it into the rest of the user experience picture. We'll A-B test whether a button should be green or blue. But will we A-B test how our performance improves if we remove our A-B framework or our fonts? We don't generally do it. We need to design for performance. You know, it's. If it's a user experience facet, we need to design it into the way we build sites. It's just another constraint, like time or um, budget. And design, you know, um, clear left, Tim Cadleck put forward the idea of a performance budget. So you decide how long should your page take to load over what conditions, how big should it be. And we need to, as well as technical solutions, we need to go and look for the human solutions. And we've come a long way, you know. We've got much faster browsers. We've got better networks. But we need better tools. We need to fit performance in, and look at it in a holistic way as, in the way we build websites. And we also need to be careful about new technologies. You know, we'd, we've got HTTP2 coming. We, don't re we know some of the performance improvements it makes, but we don't know what other impacts may come with it. We've got web components that we talked about this morning, and things like the potential blocking effect of RHEL equals import. 
Um, and we need to work out, if we deploy web components on a large scale in a blocking format, what are the issues it brings? And now, I believe our moderator will put to us your questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> so Andy's, Andy's frustrated because he's going to spend the rest of his career as a human pattern matcher. I don't think that fits in a tweet, but it would be really good if it did. OK, so kick off, first question uh, is basically one on responsive web design from Peter O'Shaughnessy. Hi. Using branched loading, The Guardian have made their new website responsive, but 42% smaller on mobile than on desktop. Does this end the performance arguments against responsive web design? Are there still cases when a separate mobile site is best? You're the front-end developer uh, representative. Wes, you want to start with this one? Uh, yeah, uh, it really depends on uh, the goals of the organization, I guess. And um, I mean, you can have a separate team sometimes. Like when I was at CNN, we had an entire separate team working on a separate mobile web site for CNN. And then we had a, and they were completely divided, and it was a really uncomfortable situation not being able to to uh, cross teams. Um, it was just the way they had siloed it off. So. Um, like I said, it, it depends on the company, like, I guess, how, what your goals are, but um, it, it does make sense for, like, uh, CRUD. If you have a heavy, like, you know, client-side application, single page, whatever, um, then you would not want to try to scale that down to put on mobile, right? I mean, chances are, you, unless you're trying to achieve the same thing on mobile, but um, sometimes developers just build for desktop first, a lot of cases, so. Um, Pat, you, you're looking at yeah. I mean, you're looking at websites all the time, web page test. And I think it's it's going to get interesting. And we're probably going to see this a lot today. Is depending on how extreme you're trying to get. Like when we start talking about deliver the above the fold content in the first 15k, right? If you're going to try and do that on mobile, the first 15k is fairly easy to get your one image and your story or whatever. What you're trying to deliver for your first 15k of your desktop or your responsive site is going to be very different. So I think it's going to be really hard to do a, a responsive, like Uber optimized <coughs> site that scales for both uh, mobile and desktop. Sure. Um, you may be able to do well Andy? enough in yeah. both. Well, I, I, I think part of the question is we know it's 42% smaller now, but how small could it be if it was catered just for that device? And you know, it's a, co it's a compromise. You know, responsive design is about building a site that works on a, a wider variety of devices as possible at an achievable cost, effort. Um, if you look at the studies, people build really small mobile sites. You can build a really a mobile site that's, you know, tens of K. Whereas, how big is the Guardian site, Patrick? 700K on a mobile, yeah. 1.2 on a desktop. Yeah, so, you know, the 42% <laughs> is a, still a huge chunk. <laughs> So, you know, it's a, it, we're, it's a work in progress as to whether the responsive argument has gone away. Luke, FT, you're in the same business, publishing? Yeah, um, we, we still have the, the separate mobile site, um, and we have a web app as well, but I think that, that's more like a, a, an internal legacy sort of thing. It, it, a lot it's of an these organizational things, constraint, yeah, not a, yeah, not it, a it's, technological thing. Yeah, it's not a technical thing. And a lot of these things, yeah, if you're starting fresh, you do it completely different, but... If you've got this big, massive website that's already there, it, it, you know, just going from that to say, going to snap our fingers and make it immediately responsive, that's, you know. There's um, a lot of inertia. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of that. So it, I, I don't know, I, I think eventually, yeah, it would be great to get there. Um, I, I think from a performance point of view as well, every, every, um, like say you're, if you're supporting every individual browser, you can make something really performant in one browser and make it work in that one use case really well. The more and more things you support, the more compromises you have to make. Like that, that goes for just desktop browsers, for example. You can optimize to Chrome and say, I'm going to make this work really well in Chrome and not care about IE. But every time you support one extra thing, you're going to have to make, you know, it, it might be small, um, compromises, it might be big, but then um, the same goes for saying if you want mobile and desktop. I think it depends what's good enough for your audience. You know, and it's, it's the YouTube example of when they shrunk YouTube, they got new audiences. Yeah, it's, it's whether The Guardian 
feel that 700K on mobile fits their audience. Well, and it, I wouldn't necessarily even look at the 700K number, right? That's the all in. Yeah. Um, it's what does it take to deliver your initial experience, mm -hmm. the visual experience, right? And focus on that. <coughs> if you can get that small enough on both the mobile and the desktop sites with, mm -hmm. with one delivery, then you're a lot better <coughs> shape working yeah. with that. So if we come, I'll take a question from Guy in, in a minute, but just when it comes back to does it end the performance arguments against responsive web design, I think we're coming to the conclusion that the answer is no. There's still some arguments <laughs> for and against. So Guy, you got a question? Well, I wanted to comment on that, that I think it's just fundamentally harder to make a responsive website faster, and that's sort of the, the reality. So I mean, I just uh, to have to look at the top 5,000 websites. Um, uh, if you could look at the top, the responsive or not responsive websites on the M.sites sites in the top 5,000 sites, uh, it's almost the the responsive websites are about three times bigger on mobile than those of M.dot sites. Just that M.dot naturally lends itself to be more lightweight and fast, while in responsive you need to do a lot of work. Possibly, eventually, you can get to the same performance, but I think we're sort of very far from the point where it's just as easy or just as uh, implied. And you can also, I mean, it's not unusual for the M.dots, especially the legacy ones, not to be doing advertising, tracking, and all sorts of other things that the business gets when they're doing a responsive one too. So you sort of. It, it, it's true and correlation is not causation and all that, right. but, uh, but the reality is that if you look even at anecdotally at pretty much all of the newly launched websites, you know, it, it, it's hard. Most of them would have done, you know, very little, at least today we've done a good job, but images, responsive images are being tackled much more frequently. But still, at the end of the day, there's just a lot more excess as compared to if you were to do something dedicated. Yeah. I, th I think so one of the interesting things is what do we need in way of tools or in browser features to be able to build sites in the same way the Guardian have built their site um, more easy, more to make that easy for everybody rather than just needing somebody with Guardian skill set developers. And I think that's probably the topic I'm going to touch on most through the day is <coughs> it is damn hard to build a fast site. Yeah. And we need it to be easy. We need it to be the default case. We need it to be, especially like with components, you just drop them on and they're fast, right? Not you have to figure out how to cache it in local storage or figure out how to plug in service workers to cache it if you're offline and not to not to fetch it if they're not. And we've got, we got two seconds. We've got two seconds left. Andrew, quick comment. I, I think it's it's a really frustrating trade-off because you have, on the one hand, as Luke says, you know you can optimize one particular user agent very well. Um, as you try to introduce more and more, I think it becomes more and more of a challenge. And I think ultimately that's not a scalable challenge because, you know, we could we'll talk later in future web about things like wearables and, and non-conventional devices and TVs and that kind of thing. Is responsive web design going to deliver one single solution to all of those things? And, and could it be performant as well? I think that's probably very, probably very unlikely. Okay. We need to move on to the new topic. And the next question is actually from Andrew Betts. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a seamless segue, <laughs> people. Um, okay, here we go. So, do, ca do concatenation and spriting become anti-patterns with the advent of HTTP2? If so, when? Mm. And, and, and he's got an entire velocity presentation <laughs> on this, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll defer to you. Um, I think we're, what we've got to be aware of is what we're doing when we concatenate and sprite stuff, and what we're, we're merging resources together. So we're merging, say, JavaScript together that's potentially got different um, rates of change. And we're making them all cacheable together. So if we can split them out, then we can cache them individually. So hopefully they live longer in the cache. Whether they become a, when do they become anti-patterns? Um, it's, it's an interesting... I'm going to pass on that for a minute. I'm going to come back to that. Somebody else pick it up and I'll... I, I think... <laughs> Yeah. You could argue that at the moment, spriting already is an anti-pattern yeah. in some circumstances. If you're doing it wrong, um, you can have, you know, forcing users to download a whole sprite when they just need one icon is just, that's just a waste of performance for everybody. So, um, you know, doing it in the wrong way can, it can already be an anti-pattern. And I think HTTP2 just makes that more obvious rather than completely changing the ballgame. Peter? Yeah, I mean, it will be, at one point, it would be right it will be hard for us as developers when we need to serve both HTTP 1.1 and 2.0. So, I mean, we need to find the best way to do it. Well, we're, we're kind of doing it now. I mean, I know I am, at least with this site, uh, it runs SpeedyM <laughs> website. <laughs> so, um, it, but I, I don't really care about older browsers right now. It's a side project. So, I mean, I can afford to, uh, but it, 
I mean, the way developers are developing sites today, I mean, you've got a lot of controllers or modules. You have a lot of different JavaScript files that you kind of divide out to organize your application on the development side. But, um, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's a tough question to answer, like, how, how could you support both, like, Speedy today and, um, and, and the older browsers that don't support it? I mean, it's, uh, it's almost like, uh, I don't know, why would you um, not concatenate everything? If it's going to save your older, but uh, it doesn't I, matter on the I think browsers. the challenge is actually when you need it on the page, um, in that if you've got a, res a, a web font that's referenced in CSS, for example, it's, you know, the browser has to download the page, so we don't know anything about the other resources we need until we download the page. Then we start parsing the CSS and parsing the DOM and building a render tree to decide we need the web font. And then we have to download the web font and wait for it to arrive. And the question becomes is, instead of concatenating or inlining stuff in CSS, is can we push those resources using HTTP2? So can we push the font object early so the font gets there <coughs> earlier so we can render the page more quickly? Well, I don't think it's even just pushing. I mean, the, the big problem we're going to have is knowing when you have to support both, right? Mm -hmm. right. But assuming right. you don't have to support both, it's the um, the granularity you get by not having to concatenate all of that stuff, right? You'll add all sorts of JavaScript into your main JavaScript file because it's needed on three pages or whatever, and all of a sudden you're bloating it, and when you break it out and you don't start mm -hmm. concatenating, you can granularly just pull down what these individual pages need. Um, on the browser side, uh, the browsers won't parse and evaluate the JavaScript until it's complete, so breaking it down into little chunks is nice for the browser as well. Um, same thing goes for the sprite. You'll have like three images on there that are needed for some random page somewhere else, and you need to rebuild the whole sprite anytime you change one of those. I think one thing that can help with this is rather than using a sprite or whatever, is if you have something that your client side application can understand the individual parts, like on um, the FT Web app, what we do if we're downloading images is we actually use JSON and have all these JSON images, then we, we can this, the, the um, the client-side code can cache each of these in, um, images separately, and it can handle them separately. And if, if, it, if we need to clear the cache or anything like that, we don't have to download the entire sprite again, because it understands each of these are individual resources. It's only for the network bit that we're actually concatenating them. Then we split them up again. And right. But this is all JSON yeah. data URIs, yeah. local storage, we, back to not making it easy for it's people horrible. to do the yeah. right thing. So yeah, it's horrible. Take, yeah. Take, a, take a quick question. <laughs> we've, got <a> question. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a question from the audience. Um, um, Mary, do you still? Uh, I was actually about the responsive image. Okay, we we'll skip that one then. Good. Jonathan Fielding. Um, so, um, what you were just talking about, would you say that with HTTP one and HTTP two, you could perhaps have to have different push different assets and like the text on the server side, so that people who are using HTTP one they're getting sprites still and using that up the old answer patterns ways. And then with HTTP2, we're actually separating it out so the cache can actually perform the best it can. They're caching the individual images. So effectively, you're saying you're gonna, it's a bit the same argument. You're going to end up with the, the M dot yeah. version, which is going to be the HTTP2 dot version. I'm going to have a load well, balancer speedy. that sends yeah. somebody to the HTTP2 pool and somebody to the HTTP 1.1 pool. I think the. Uh, you're not going to be penalized at all if you continue your old ways of development. They are anti-patterns, and they do cause us as developers more frustration, right? But, um, or more work, essentially. But um, you're not, I don't think you're going to be, uh, actually, I know you're not going to be penalized um, for uh, concatenating versus not concatenating um, on the HTTP2 side, right? Well, you so, get penalized in cache terms, potentially. Um, but no more so than you get with HTTP1. Speedy pushes to the cache, though, right? I mean, it pushes straight. Yes, there will be possibly a larger download, but I mean, once BD op or HTTP2, once it opens a connection, it will push directly to the cache, even if you have caching disabled um, in your browser. So, so du during this, during this, I think so. So the issue, if I'm clear, is the, you know during this intervening period when you're going to have to support both protocols. Yeah, it's, it's really going to be painful. It's, it's more for the developers. I, I think it's more for us to have better workflows and. Um, not have to go th jump through so many hoops, and that's kind of what HTTP2 will bring. But um, yeah, I think I mean automate it. You'll have to decide at some point: do you have server-side logic that mm -hmm. detects and spits out the HTML? Because fundamentally, it needs to be in the HTML. Um, 
differently for speedy or HTTP2 versus HTTP1? Or do you look at your traffic mix and you go, OK, now we've got 70% of our traffic coming in that's speedy or HTTP, HTTP2 capable. It'll be slower for the older browsers or the smaller right. group, but, but it's worth it, it doesn't break, side, right? Yeah. It's you decide at what yeah. point do you cut or over. Or you use something like Mod page speed that's protocol aware. So <laughs> it'll do the optimizations for HTTP1, and it'll do different optimizations for HTTP2. I know Just Google do, had a speed. report out last November about uh, using speedy on um, maps and drive and a few different properties, and they observed uh, like around a 30% increase on all those. So. Um, <laughs> I mean, at least we have some larger mm. uh, uh, entities leading the way there. Um, we need to we need to move on to the next okay. topic. But just on the on the HTTP two, just so I mean the timeline, you know, it's specification is not even due to be ratified until November. You've got to get all of the yeah. web server effectively. Speedy's out there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Speedy's out there now. IE eleven. Yeah. Chrome, Firefox, yeah. it's effectively okay. all the capabilities are already out there. So okay. it's what's your traffic mix, what's your server side support, and what's yeah. your. So if you're expecting HTTP2 to answer all your questions, it's probably a way away, but you can start playing with some of the ideas and the technology with Speedy. Cool. Next question Patrick Hammond. Um, so, as Steve Sard has uh, said in a great blog post in May last year, that we need to move past the on-page uh, events and metric. Sorry, the on-load uh, events and metric. And with a lot of us moving kind of enhancements to past that load event as well, you know, what is the new golden metric, or is there one? Peter, I'll throw that one to you. You, yeah. you, 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 make, you make a tool which measures yeah. performance. I, I, I mean, it is speed index that we have in web page test, but we want to move it to other tools and uh, be able to use it in RAM also. I mean, we need to know when uh, the content is, uh, the above default content is, uh, is, an, is in the browser. I mean, th that's the important thing. Or how do you guys see it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, speed fundamentally, um, if you own the site you're trying to measure, instrument it. You are the one who knows what you care about. So put on load handlers for your above the fold images, for example. Um, tag your ads so you know when they load. And then beacon all of that stuff back. I mean, nothing is ever going to beat custom instrumentation. Uh, doing it generically, that's when you start to get into to difficult cases, right? If, you have, if you're a RUM service offering something to everyone and trying to automatically tell them when they're above content uh, is above the fold contents complete. That's a much harder, currently unsolved problem. Um, yeah, I mean, synthetic, I like speed index, obviously. Um, but you really de do need to move beyond the technical point when everything finished, because there is so much stuff on pages these days that's not user visible. All of the ads tracking, the analytics, there's even your AB platform testing, all sorts of stuff, um, the single page apps that scroll down forever, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out a generic complete load time metric for pages is tough. Yeah. I try to encourage people to target start render time. So when some of the visitor actually starts to see something in the browser, you know, my preferred option after that is speed index, which measures when the viewport is complete, visually complete. And for what it's worth, there is start render in the RUM from IE and Chrome. It's kind of buried in different places, like window.performance.msfirstpane, I think, is IE's. But is it real you or want is it a to, paint of a white screen? <laughs> right. So <laughs> you'll want to make sure it's real for some sites and it's not real for mm -hmm. others. So you'll want to actually test the pages you're looking at first to see if it's actually a useful metric for you uh, before you start basing any decisions based on that. So quick, quick audience poll. Who, who Realistically, in their websites, are sort of using the page on load event as their most common page load metric. No? Yes? No? F first Not question many? to start with is who actually measures their page load <laughs> times? <laughs> okay, so only about, what, about half the audience is actually measuring their page load times? Who's actually doing custom instrumentation so they know exactly when they're above the fold? Okay. And who doesn't work for the Guardian, the FT? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay, Christian, Christopher Imry, JWT. Yeah. Well, my question was actually 
touching on, I mean, we're, we're going on about like using the page on load event as the kind of de facto, that's when the page is ready. I mean, I work for an advertising company and I've kind of come to peace with that, but actually they, <laughs> it brings with it a lot of actually knowledge and actually in advertising, they've actually dealt with this problem about 10 years ago. And they actually, in, when you're building adverts to specifically digital ones, you have polite load. So the idea is the minimum viable content that you need on the page to get it functional without distracting the user. At the end of the day, ads are passive experiences when they're dealt with a constant page. So the restrictions inherent in that platform kind of mean that we have to be as efficient as possible. And actually, now when we're doing a lot of sites, now we've done actually some of the very effective kind of responsive sites, we take the same thing. There's a whole lot load. We actually defer everything that we need for about three seconds when the, after the page load event. The idea that's enough time for someone to click on a menu button and click deeper into the site should they want to. So we're not actually forcing them to wait. And this is a strategy that we're using right now. It actually works quite effectively. And it means that it, it, it kind of blurs the line. Like the page isn't ready, a page on load, but it's actually usable. And actually above the fold, everything looks the same. As soon as the JavaScript files after three seconds, we then hook into that. And then all the carousels start working, all the you know interactive videos and things like that fire up. Um, Patrick, you got a comment on that? No, just that that's, that's great. And it's good to hear from an advertising company that actually doing that. Yeah, I was about to say. It, yeah, it means he's going to get out of the room alive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but on, on that note, something uh, going back to, to measurement and metrics, something that we've been doing with adverts, and we, we uh, now that resource um, priorities API and timing APIs is here, we've, we're starting to have discussions with our advertising suppliers that, so that they can um, set the timing allow origin all uh, flag so that then we will be able to beacon and measure and on our run graphs have the statistical data for the load, the load time of our adverts, and we'll, we'll know when things are going bad or good on that, on that side. But anyway, it's, it's very pleasing to hear advertising companies talk about that. And contrary to sort of popular opinion, um, you generally do want to get your ads loaded early, um, so your users will see them, click on them, and you will make money. <laughs> um, so it, it's really important that you actually know when your ads are loading, though. And, you know, I've talked to several companies that just stopped loading ads uh, so that they'll get faster page load times, and that's the wrong answer, right? It's how do you get your ads not competing with your content, but both loading visually quickly for the users, um, because at the end of the day, you still want to make money. It would be superbly interesting to get more insights like from companies like you, but you're obviously not allowed to talk about it, I think. <laughs> but talk a little bit. This but, is yeah. like the same problem we have with Flash. Flash solved all the problems that HTML5 has, but the information never got out. And we probably have a lot of performance stuff in the uh, in the ad space that was never talked about because of the competitive advantage over other ad providers. Yeah. If I can just do a follow on Please. point. I mean, actually, the previous point we were talking about having, you know, whether responsive or actually a mobile versus a desktop site, um, we actually find because we're building kind of campaign sites, so we're doing it for a brand, it's like three to six months, it lives and then it kind of dies. Um, a lot of those, because they have a lot of money thrown at them, both in media spend targeting to it as well as kind of you know, organic search. Um, we find it's kind of a tricky road. We're actually finding a lot of times having the dedicated mobile site works because at the end of the day, there's like a path to purchase that we kind of want the user to do. And the desktop might have that rich, immersive, kind of interactive visual video experience, whatever that might be. But actually, on, you know, when it comes to mobile, the use case is different. So actually, we're finding a lot of times, even though we push for response every time, realistically, mobile. You know, gives you that direct path to purchase. There's ad dollars behind it. At the end of the day, you got to get the customer's product sold. At the end of it. Cool. Um, so, so to summary, the answer is there a new golden metric? No. no, it's the one you roll yourself using user timing in the navigation in the timing API. And beacon it back, beacon it back somewhere where you actually look at it. Yeah. Don't just instrument <laughs> the page. It's a bit like Bitcoining. You got to mine your own gold. <laughs> <coughs> right. Next question is from Patrick Hammond. Hi, <laughs> oh, it's me again. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually, this is a very similar question, but it, it's in a different light. So how, um, we're now very well equipped to measure our initial page loads performance um, with great tools like web page test um, and, and, and things like RUM. But yet we're seeing a rise in, in large scale, long living single um, page applications. But, so do we need new tools? Um, to measure these and new metrics and new visualizations to, to measure long living applications that we're seeing on the web. So performance measurement in single page apps. User timing. Well, I mean, it, it's back to instrument, <laughs> instrument yeah. it and figure it out. I mean, you've got, hopefully the browsers are giving you all of the primitives you need. 
uh, to understand what's going on, um, especially in the single page apps as you swap in content as you scroll down and do stuff. Um, if you're not getting the primitives you need, I know we were talking like at Velocity Summit a few weeks ago or months ago at this point mm -hmm. uh, about possibly adding um, load event timing handlers or first paint timing handlers to images and stuff like that to all elements so that you can get the, the primitives. But it really does come down to uh, you know what you want to do with your app, um, time it, beacon it back, and if you can't get it what, you're, what you need, let us know. I think it becomes more of a rendering thing too, right? I mean, your page is already set up, so it's, it's about image decoding and making AJAX requests and getting the images and decoding those and um, any other transforms you're doing to the page, and that's really where it comes into uh, jank and other kinds of measurements as well. I also yeah, suspect so. there's probably some APM vendors in the, uh, in, in the house that would have a conversation about if you've got a single page app that's doing lots of AJAX requests to the, to, to the back end, you, you know, your sort of that measurement is also going to become more inherently related to the measurement of that round trip time for that back end AJAX request and you've got to start tying those two things tighter together for those single I page think apps. it also depends if you're if you're um, waiting on all those AJAX requests, like in our web app, um, as soon as because we've gone for, we want something that works offline, we try and make it when you click stuff, you're never waiting for an AJAX request, right? We want all the content to be there up front and in advance. So it really depends on your, your site, whether you're doing these click and wait for content to come or whether you're doing something else in the background. And that, I think that affects what you need to measure as well. So you guys are putting everything in local storage, right? Um, I, Local storage and web SQL, or okay. index to be, depending on the browser. So what is like your limit? Like, is there a limit on the content you download? Like, um, you we actually have like, it's a bit complicated. There's different modes, and like when you first load, we try and just get the the basics, so just the article content. We don't bother with all the images and stuff, um, because on some browsers, well, particularly old ones, you, you need to press a prompt to allow like 50 mm -hmm. megs of storage or whatever, and then right. we'll go and start doing all the images and stuff. But we try and keep all that in the background where possible, and um, it, it should, we, we try and not get in the way of the user, right? They, they should just be able to navigate the app and So it comes care. down to rendering at that point? Yeah, it, it's all down to rendering. But aren't you just generating another problem when they run out of local storage? Mm -hmm. And they have to go for, to man actually start managing local storage themselves? That, it is so yeah, if, well, we yeah. we if we come back to the, to the question about do we need new tools, new metrics, and new visualizations, you're saying if, if a single page app measuring the rendering of that thing that I've done becomes critical, do we have the tools? I mean, Peter, you, you, you make tools. Do we have the tools to measure that right now? And I think the answer is probably not. Actually, we do, but they're manual. I mean, you have um, the timeline and dev tools of rendering and painting events. Um, but <clears throat> I don't know, is that so, uh, automated? Uh, request animation frame is probably your best friend. Um, mm -hmm. But back to it's not easy, right? I mean. Figuring out if, if your single page app is behaving smoothly on the client side in RUM uh, by hooking together a bunch of RAF calls um, and looking for jank and that kind of stuff. It's doable, um, but it's complicated. So the answer, uh, how much time do I have? So the answer, the answer to that too is, is yes, we probably do need new tools and new metrics. But and I think with, you get to a point where, to be honest, sometimes it's best just having a manual tester using it and going, that's a bit sluggish. You know, th there's some things that, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's not the answer anybody but, wants. But, but then you're, somebody... you're limited by CPU and, and whatever your system is running. Yeah, but that's what the user's going to do at the end of the day. That's, that's what the no, I know. Right? We've, got a, we've got a hand up over here. IE11 has a lazy load attribute for images. Is it worth maybe having a kind of, oh, sorry. IE11 has a lazy load attribute for images. Is it worth having maybe a, an attribute for a tag which would be like above the fold or which would basically give the browser a hint that this is your main content that you want to prioritize. Or maybe below the fold, you'd have a lazy well, tag. There's a combination. It depends on the browser yeah. what's going to be above the fold. You don't know whenever you're sending the this stuff down, like where, where, where is that fold going to be if people can There use is it. no fold in the browser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but say if um, on BBC you'd have all your main images or your stories, and then you've got your sub stories. So you basically want to tell the browser to prioritize yeah, so that's not a IE specific. Um, IE was the first ones to implement it. It's a W3C spec for lazy load, and I think postpone is the other one, or I'll probably get the naming wrong, but there's sort of two of them. One is 
um, don't load this until later, and one is I care less about this. And it's sort of the, the opposite of saying this is important, but you'd have to tag all of your content, and it's kind of an uh, attempt to eliminate the JS lazy load uh, uh, implementations for images while still letting the browser know about all the content and give it priority hints. Um, so the this is above the fold and important is basically the stuff on your page that doesn't have lazy load on it. Um, but you should start seeing it uh, come out to the other browsers. It's part of the same group that did the performance specs. We've got about a minute left. I'm going to take one last question from Alois down the back there. If you can run the mic, we'll <coughs> yell very loudly, Alois. Just yeah, down. Oh. Yeah. Well, for the video. So about the single page app topic, do we need new tools and new visualizations? Um, tooling wise, so there's, there's a couple of RAM tools who worked into this. And there's commercial ones, but there's also Caliper who looked into frameworks. And I think the story is a twofold one. First of all, we need definitely support from uh, framework vendors because that's how we made it possible. We had to interact with them. Because a lot of their asynchronous logic we have to follow, just like typing in a keyword, it goes back with an XHR to the server, updates the table, and then renders it on the page. Um, it comes down to framework instrumentation that you would have to do, or frameworks would build this instrumentation right into those frameworks. Mm -hmm. That's the part it definitely is, I think, Kay. with the framework vendors, and they have to do it because they are the ones who know best how the frameworks actually work. Um, the other piece to it is, um, what we're really missing is that piece. Like, with, with this framework instrumentation, I could to the point, like I updated the DOM, is really knowing when certain elements have been painted on the screen. That would then be something I see in the browser. The question where fit this instrumentation of frameworks, on the one hand, frameworks should build it in. For those who have not built it in, you would also have to have some means in the browser to instrument the browser at runtime, because that's what you have to do today, because certain um, RAM tools are often not able uh, to instrument it while it is sent to the browser, or it can do any pre-processing here. Okay. But it, it's a two-fold story. It's a framework story <coughs> to a great extent, and there's two solutions to it. Okay. And it's also a story really, uh, when it comes to rendering, that really ties down to the browser. Got to move on to the, to the, to the next topic, but just to summarize that, I think that was a good, there was a good point made there. There's some big sort of emphasis maybe shifting to the framework vendors to really help people understand the performance and, and the timing instrumentation within that framework, plus there's also the point you're making about the, the browser vendors, but we got to move on. Rich Howard. Uh, so my question to both the panel and to the audience is, um, what role will automated front-end optimization tools play in our increasingly complex world? Do they add yet another complicated layer of abstraction, or will they become a necessity? So FEO tools like, you know, Mod Page Speed or um, uh, Riverbed Stinger Optimizer. I mean, you're a, you're a fan of Varnish. That's a front-end reverse proxy type. Stuff. I think uh, I'd class Varnish as different than those mm. sort of things because Varnish it behaves mm. like a HTTP proxy. You know, it, it follow by default it'll follow HTTP headers and it won't do anything weird. A lot of these other ones, I I get very hesitant about using things that are just going to do magic in front of any code I write. I think it's such a large education process for front end developers as well. I mean, especially those that um, might just be you know entry level to mid level. Um, it's it's. A lot of companies are trying to take care of things like uh, like performance and um, and security with appliances and and uh, plugins and and things that go along with the with the web server. So um, I don't know if it's needed or not. I mean, I, I don't know if, if web developers should just know the rules automatically or if they need the help uh, to, to. So I think I there's think so, yeah. uh, Peter first. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I. I as a developer, I want to know what happens, so I don't like these kind of tools because I don't know exactly, yeah. exactly as I said, the, the, mag, the magic things about it. Are, it's make me un unsecure, actually. But, <laughs> but, but as an operations manager <laughs> who's been waiting for the developers to speed up the website for ages, if I can f sling 50 grand at, uh, at Riverbed and it makes my site faster, that's the cost of one developer. Well, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> so I'll give Andy a come and knock on that. I, I, we're trying to optimize for different browsers that behave in different ways, different devices over different network conditions. Um, I think for a certain number of customer people, I think it's the only way to go. I think it because yeah. you know we're trading off the cost of employing developers who 
may not be doing a great job anyway, you know, because there are some great developers in the world and there are some very average developers, and we see it in the way that pages behave. And it's, you know, if I can deploy an automated device that will speed up that site and give those visitors a better experience, then why not? So I'll take, I'll take a comment from, from Perry, and can somebody refresh on slide? Because I think it's crashed. No. <laughs> Damn, Just we need somebody so to press their yeah. So Perry, stand up and wait for the mic. Mm -hmm. Quick. Let's go. <laughs> All I was going to say is that I think I agree with Steve and with Andy, because I think, you know, we're, we're getting asked as developers, ops, web ops, whatever we, whatever we do, we're getting asked to do more and more and more with less and less and less time to do it. And it's actually the business that's going to di dictate this, I think. And I think that these kind of automated um, tools and devices are, are going to be the only way that we're going to be able to keep up with. So that it's going to be HP2 versus HP1.1. Mm -hmm. already, we're already struggling. We're just dealing with what we have to deal with now. And it's only going to get worse. We're talking about later on, there's going to be new devices, wearable technologies, TVs to concern ourselves with. I, I just think we're going to have to do it. And for those of us that are not in the consult, uh, performance consulting uh, ring, I guess um, it's, it's hard to get time in companies to work on performance to make your pages faster. It's hard to sell a lot of bosses on, on doing that as, as developers who work on an application um, or a site that's driven by whatever advertising dollars, whatever you want to call it, uh, someone else's budget, basically, and they don't want to allot for that performance boost. Um, I can speak to that personally. So, yeah. And I think there's some class of optimizations that mm -hmm. you're going to start getting more comfortable with handing off. Um, the one that comes to mind in particular is image transcoding, uh, yeah. supporting WebP. There's a whole bunch of things that you're not going to want to have to rebuild an image server, and you'll start pushing off to appliances or a service to do for you, because uh, you're not going to want to maintain libraries of 10 different image formats as we get like WebP, JPEG, XR, and whatever else comes down the pipe. I think there's a difference between you know making a conscious decision as a developer saying, I want to farm this off to somebody else who's going to look after my images, to have just some appliance stuck in front of all <laughs> your code that does whatever it wants because it thinks it's better. We, we've had problems with um, mobile operators doing this sort of thing where they're going like, oh, that bit of JavaScript, we, we can optimize that for you. Sorry, the, per like, the, the person who asked this question works for Vodafone. <laughs> well, we, we, in the early days of the web, that was one of the things that caught us off guard. And you know, the, because uh, yeah, operators think that they know things better than you, but if you're a developer who knows what they're doing, sometimes you know better than the appliance, and the appliance just gets in your way. I think, I think, you know, will they, will they become a necessity or an increasingly complex world? I guess the question is, do you see the world, we've talked about components, we've talked about HTTP 2.0. I, I don't see the world getting less complex. So there's only so much complexity that you can deal with as a developer, surely, before somebody's going to say, let's hand this off to an automated process that does it better. I'm sure Guy would say that, you know, Akamai, the next generation CDNs, so yes, I'm you know totally biased here and I work for Akamai uh, Stand up. But, um, but but I do think that you know two things. One, as, as opposed to the carrier proxies, the intent here is to be something that's an extension of your platform, so it's to save you time. It operates based on your instructions. Granted, instead of writing code, you're checking a box, uh, but you're tuning it and you're configuring it to your needs. So. Not quite as simple as a Varnish HTTP instruction, but not that much different than Varnish ESI or than Varnish uh, uh, kind of elaborate caching policies. Um, so that's just sort of a, a general thought. And yeah, and I think the the point I come come back to every time we talk to uh, to users of this or people considering using it is, you know, if you can automate it, why do it manually? So the the exact range of where the tool's good enough, where are they not good enough? What what is your level of comfort? That's something that as a as a, an industry, we still need to evolve and improve. But I think at the end of the day, if you have a way to do it automatically and it encompasses knowledge and takes away complexity, you know, the, the, only, the only reason not to do so is that you're not used to it, right? And you can overcome that. But. 30 seconds if you want to go, go this way. Edge. And sorry, was it? I, I just wanted to add on to terms of what you're saying. And it's great that Very companies quickly. like yourself are trying to act as an extension of the platform, but actually, because of my experience with the kind of clients I'm dealing, our MSAs don't actually give us free reign on our platform. We have to play by their rules. 
So a lot of times what is in our control are things like the build tools, optimizing things down at our end with regards to before we get onto that platform. So a lot of times, like I said, sticking to the basics effectively is often the best platform. If you grab Mike over, go over here. One last very quick question. Or very quick comment. I'm interested in the hardware <coughs> side of this uh, because I work for a hardware company. <coughs> so. um, for me, load time is important. Yes, you need to get stuff down as quickly as possible. But what's more important is how quickly the user can see the stuff. And that goes through the hardware. You were discussing stuff like batching is bad. But do you consider the hardware under underlying as well? Batching is really good for a GPU to work with. So batching, a GPU doesn't know how to deal with a sprite, though, right? So as far as the browser is concerned, the GPU doesn't deal with the sprite. The GPU deals with the sprite in a whole bunch of different places and clips it and doesn't deal with it better than images. But does so it? I'm going to cut, I'm gonna have to cut that one off, and you can take it okay. offline, because we've got about five minutes left, and we've still got a question to go from Paul Lewis, which actually ties in very neatly with um, a... Um, Something that was just mentioned, actually. Um, my question got tweaked. So <laughs> <laughs> which is the topic of the day, so I thought I'd fight fire with fire and tweak it back. Um, how should teams balance branding and personality against performance? And I guess I had web fonts and images and such in mind. And how can they meaningfully measure the benefits of branding versus the benefit of speed? And then I had a hashtag perf matters on the end. Hashtag perf matters, always good. I mean, you started to talk about this in the answer to the previous question that you know you come up against the thing. The designers want their cool web fonts. They don't necessarily want performance. Right, it's, it's the same kind of argument as the mobile versus desktop side, I guess. I mean, you have to measure, um, I, I mean, uh, the business knows what it wants, whether it's, it's, it's a brochure side or whether it's, uh, or it doesn't want its users to drop off because the page load time is, is too high, or, or whether there's a lot of jank going on in the page because uh, they can't scroll down the page and, and their user base drops because of that. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it's about uh, do, do you want better performance or do you want um, better looking, uh, better looking site? And I guess there's a balance somewhere in between there. But uh, right now, you, you really have to focus on one or the other, I think. I guess I'm interested also in the any recommendations on a meaningful discourse that designers and so, so, who's, so who's, who's had this conversation with their business on, so who wants to stand up and, and reach for a microphone to say, we've had this conversation with our business and how, this is how we tackled it. Patrick, go on. You know you want to. Or oh, next, go on. And yeah, Tag team it. Behind you. Yeah, we've had this conversation quite a lot, actually. So what organization? Uh, uh, the Guardian. Guardian. Um, so designers like their beautiful web fonts, but mobile users don't like to wait for the text to show up. So uh, what we've uh, found is that maybe we could find a compromise. Maybe you can have the really, really iconic fonts in there on mobile, but the, the other fonts, maybe you can load them only on desktops. Uh, so that's the kind of compromise we came up with now. But I mean, who's so, talking about? Talking sorry, about, can I answer Paul's yeah, question? Yeah, because yeah. the other, the thing lots of people do is, you know, we talk about fonts and how many people just chuck Open Sans or a font on the page without considering all the font glyphs in it. So there are, even using web fonts, there are optimization options in the take out the glyphs we're not using, which takes, you know, Google, Open Sans off Google. If you start stripping it down to just font, the glyph font glyphs you need for English, <coughs> it ends up being 60% of the original size. Sorry, 60% reduction in size. Um, so you end up with a much smaller glyph that's quicker to download that you can embed as a data URI so you avoid the round trip. You know, and it's a, it's a choice. Some, some brands, it's, it's as a brand, measure what the impact of performance is having and test whether you, know, you can take stuff out of the page and still keep your brand quality and whether that has an impact on you know, visitor behavior. And I think... I think so this is the thing I think, I think maybe the panel, I don't know, is still missing, missing the question, which is, which is how do you get your business to engage in this conversation? And I think the answer has to be you've got to be able to measure the performance and tie the performance back to the measurement of your site. 
Perry gave a presentation at Velocity this year where he gave some great examples where they were tying it into the analytics, they tied it into their Adobe Omniture, so the marketing people could see very clearly that conversion rate changed at this point in time. So step one is measure your performance. Step two, measure the performance the money. Step three, start doing A-B testing of slow versus fast or pretty versus not so pretty. And the, the key thing there is make sure your performance data is in with the business metrics. Mm -hmm. Having them completely separately where they can't sort of correlate the two to each other becomes a really big problem. It becomes difficult to say the extra two seconds is costing you 10,000 users a day kind of thing. Um, but if you want to have a conversation, just strip out all the web fonts. They'll come find you. <laughs> you want to figure out how to start Take the conversation. I just want to say, with regards to this, I've actually had this exact conversation with our clients. And because of the type of company I'm in, we actually have a lot of media money in terms of TV ads pointing at web properties. And we actually find that a lot of it, actually, the conversation about performance is actually being talked to by the client. It's actually out of fear. Um, and it's actually two sides of the coin. We're talking page load performance. So if the server can't handle the load, actually coming in, it's pointless about fonts and stuff like that. So our, a lot of our conversations actually start off with, okay, well, what's the media buy? Okay, we're expecting, you know, it's going to be on how many TV channels, stuff like that. They're going to drive it to it. We have to keep the server up. So there's that part of it. And then on top of that, it then becomes, well, if it's a path to purchase with regards to buying a product, then it becomes, a, okay, well, how fast can they do that? Not so much. You know, if there's different parts of the site that load a bit slower, that's okay. It depends on that critical path in terms of how fast they, can they get to kind of click the buy button. Um, so in terms of my experience, the, the really big brands are talking performance, but it kind of comes from a fear factor that they don't want the site to go down, they don't want to be a laughing stock, and they don't want to lose their kind of value, if, you know, the, uh, was it the performance of, you know, metrics, how many visitors to how many, you know, people have purchased. We're going to have to wrap it up there. I'm sorry to, to get your, not be able to get to your question, but uh, we're actually reaching the end of the session. So I think the message there is play the fear, uncertainty, and doubt card, and your site will crash if you put all this stuff on it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not, not an argument I like from an operations point of view, because it's my fault if the site goes down. But anyway. So anyway, thanks very much, guys. Thanks to everybody on the panel for contributing. Thanks great contributions from the floor. And um, yeah, well done. <laughs>